Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this joint session of Government Operations and Fiscal Policy and our Public Safety uh, Committees. We have five items that we will be uh, discussing today. Um, our first item is our Supplemental Appropriation Number 24-30 to the FY24 Operating Budget, Montgomery County Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security, COVID-19 FEMA Contract Support for $300,000. Um, unless the Chair of Public Safety has anything to say, we will mm -hmm. turn it over to Mr. Howard and start our meeting. Good morning. Uh, this one is fairly straightforward. This is a $300,000 supplemental appropriation to OEMHS uh, for COVID-19 FEMA contract support. Uh, last uh, spring, during budget season, you reviewed and approved uh, an appropriation for the same purpose um, in FY, for FY23 dollars. Um, and these are dollars that the county is paying to a contractor to help process the and work through the FEMA reimbursement process. Um, the uh, these dollars that are being spent are reimbursable by FEMA, so it's kind of a, a weird circle. Um, so to date, the um, and I think Director Hutchin might have some updated numbers on here, but in, when the when this was transmitted, uh, OEMHS had submitted nine hundred eighty-six thousand dollars in contractor costs to FEMA and had received six hundred ten thousand dollars so far. Um, in terms of fiscal impact, this does come from the general fund reserves. However, it will likely, it's very likely to be uh, reimbursed by FEMA, so there wouldn't be a long-term fiscal impact as there would be a different appropriation coming from general fund reserves. Um, the only other thing I'll note is the racial equity impact assessment um, found that there was insufficient detail to conduct uh, an analysis or draw conclusions about potential racial equity impacts. Um, and council staff supports approval um, as submitted by the executive. Patrick, would you like to update us on anything? Sure. Good morning, Council. Great to see you. Um, since then, uh, as you can see in your packet, we submitted this in November, so we've made some progress since then. I just want to update you on. Um, as a reminder, we've submitted $218 million to FEMA um, for consideration for reimbursement. So far, we have received nearly $70 million, about 69 and change. Uh, just recently, in the last month, we've received approval for an additional $44.3 million, so that's been obligated by FEMA, so we're just waiting payment on that. Um, so that brings the total that we received, or we are waiting to, uh, waiting to receive and expect to receive in the next uh, few weeks, $214 million. That leaves a balance of $104 million that's still in somewhere in the approval process with FEMA, um, and that's exactly what these contractors are working on, is working on collecting the additional documentation, making the justifications, and as you can see, it's um, yielded very positive results for us so far. Um, also since then, as Craig was mentioning, uh, $610,000 was the original amount that we had submitted for um, the management expenses, which are being approved here today. Uh, we also had $376,000 that was still outstanding when we submitted this uh, request. That has since been reimbursed. So we have been reimbursed for the entirety of our management expenses by FEMA at this point. Um, but nonetheless, they go back into the general fund, um, so we need to come back and ask for uh, additional uh, appropriation in order to continue to fund these contractors. So I thank you for your consideration today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, and I just want to note, um, understanding that going through the FEMA reimbursement process is not an easy one, and I want to say thank you to your office um, for and, and everyone who uh, submits the forms, keeps track of our spending, um, and the excellent job that you all must be doing given um, the, how much we have been able to be reimbursed. Um, before I turn to my colleagues, I did have one question. You know, as we're looking forward to the FY25 budget, do you um, believe that this is going to be an expense that we're going to have to see in FY25 as well? Yes, I think it is, and we did not submit it as part of our budget package to the county executive, and the reason being FEMA's been so unpredictable with their timeline that we feel it's a safer bet and more precise for us to come back periodically for uh, these supplementals. I realize that's not an ideal way of, of budgeting, but nonetheless, we really have no idea if it takes them, sometimes it takes them a week to review an invoice, sometimes it takes them several months. Um, so it, it really is, we're at the behest of, of FEMA on this one. So I do expect to continue to incur costs into FY25 in order to maximize what we are uh, being returned and reimbursed by FEMA. It's just hard to predict exactly the level of contractual support we'll need for that. Thank you very much. Um... 
Council Member Katz. Find my mic, yeah. but first off, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, I, I guess maybe we should say that we need an emergency management to get money from FEMA. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's that kind of situation. But bottom line on this is that we need to make certain that we're doing the life-saving, in many cases, life-saving services that, that this money represents. And if FEMA decides that they're not going to reimburse, reimburse the county, as angry or as upset that is, is that we make us, we still have to do the right thing. So I appreciate, I, I agree with the, uh, with the uh, stay of suggestion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Oh, yeah. Council Member Lukey. Thank you. Um, quick question, and I know you don't you don't have a crystal ball that tells you when FEMA is going to give you things, no. right? We, if only everybody wishes across the state that they could do that. Um, but my question is, out of you know, based on practice and experience over time, um, what percentage of, of funding doesn't come back to us either because there's some incurable thing because we all know like you can get a thing back that says you need to submit more paperwork hence the contractors and the, the excellent work they do but is there any kind of substantial chunk of funding that does not ever get reimbursed by FEMA in not so experience? far right okay that's what so, I thought <laughs> uh, and that that is why we continue to put the work into this and it does take a tremendous amount of work and obviously it takes time um, but to us, it's well worth it to continue sure. to engage with them and go back and forth with multiple iterations until we do get the full amount that's reimbursed. Now, looking forward, there are some food expenses, there's some non-congregate sheltering involved that we've all talked about here before mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. past that are kind of iffy about what's going to be allowable and what's not allowable. And a lot of that depends on the timeline it falls into during the COVID response, because as many of you know, the FEMA rules changed several times during yes. that response. So that's going to take a determination from FEMA. That's really where the uncertainty is. But if you're talking about precedent so far, we've re been reimbursed for everything that we've sent in. It, it may have taken a little while longer because it asked for additional justification, but nonetheless, a, the full amount has come back to us. And how often are they um, releasing technical assistance or other guidance on that, on these, you know, these are what people would call nitpicky questions, yet financially significant and, and in terms of the services that were delivered, significant. Yeah, so they, um, formal technical assistance is not coming out that frequently. However, we do each have a program manager assigned to us at mm -hmm, FEMA mm -hmm. who engages with us on a daily basis. Um, and that, that process has worked exceptionally well considering the normal public assistance process. It allows us to have kind of an informal review and a lengthy discussion in advance of the very formal review. Um, what holds us back a lot of times is that our reimbursements are so large in comparison to what many other counties are submitting right. that they require congressional approval. So after mm -hmm. it meets all of the FEMA requirements, has to go to OMB and Congress as well, which is a truncated process. Nonetheless, it takes time to yeah. get on an agenda just like sure. any other body we would work with. Um, so there is some delay there, but I think they, they maintain constant communication. The only delay, appreciable delay that we've seen that was sort of out of everybody's hands was when the disaster relief fund went unfunded. They put a pause yeah. on payments. Yeah. That didn't stop any of the behind the scenes work. We sure. continued to process the reimbursements. We just knew the payments were going to have to wait until that was restored, mm -hmm. which happened, as you guys know, several weeks later. Yeah, super. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Great. Council President Friedson. Uh, thank you. Uh, echo the, the comments and appreciation for all the hard work that has happened. Obviously, this has been uh, a moving target uh, in an unprecedented situation, very challenging to, uh, to, to handle. And obviously, if we can get reimbursed for hiring people to help us to submit to get more money, that is a good thing. So obviously, very supportive of this. Um, just a couple requests. Um, the first one is a uh, question and a request. When the submissions are going in, we were getting notified you know, previously during the depths of the recession when this was like a very common topic. I don't think that's happening anymore, and so I want to ask, can you do that and uh, request that that happen? So, Sure. Sorry, I can answer that first one. Um, to be clear, all of the requests have gone in. So we had a deadline that we had to meet in order to submit all of the initial requests. So we're in the process right now of going back and forth with providing them with additional documentation to support those requests. 
So you may not have seen requests gone in, but that's because they were due as of November right. of, so of last year. I was going to ask you, that was going to be my second question. So the consultant now is helping to put together the packets, essentially, the backup materials to argue to get the money. Correct. That have already been submitted. Right. Okay. And it, it, the, the, the rationale there, and this was kind of strategic, was that we understand how long it takes to collect all of this information from all the different departments involved, all the different community organizations. Had we waited to collect the full amount, we would have missed that deadline. So the, the deal we broker with FEMA, which is not uncommon with all of the other counties and municipalities that have been involved in this process, is that we would make the initial submission, they would make the review, and the determination would come back and say this is the exact number and type of documentation you need to support this. So I don't know if that clarifies why you haven't seen a new submission, because there hasn't been a new submission. The only thing that's an update to an existing submission. Right. It's, it's, like a place it's not changing the, the physical the amount. The dollar amount right, that's exactly. being requested. Okay. So and however, yeah. I'll add, we do have a weekly report that we get from our consultant and our team internally that we compile, and I'd be more than happy to share that with you so that you can see on a weekly basis how much it changes. Yeah, um, I think that would be helpful if you could just share with the council that absolutely. you don't have to create something new. It's not additional work. But just so we understand from a tracking perspective, then the the second piece on the notification is the money in. You know, this is a good good news. We were talking about you know requesting, and we were never going to get money. Yet we were basing major fiscal decisions in the county on this the, the money coming in. The you know executive branch I thought was way too ambitious. I expressed concerns about that. We're we're past that. But now we're getting money back, and there's a question of. You know, how is that money going to be used? Right now, it goes into undesignated reserves. It's just money coming back. Um, but what is the notification process to the council when we receive actual reimbursements? Like, so we make a we get approved, and then the money actually is received. And when we get the actual electronic payment and is in our coffers at that point, that is when we make the notification to council. So you have not not been notified, but when I talk about something that's been obligated at 44.3, that's obligated at the FEMA level, but it needs to continue that, then that payment is issued to the state, and then the state issues a payment to us. So it's a little bit delayed. So when you see these, and these are two distinct payments, one's going to be $11 million and one's $33 million. When we actually see those hit our bank account, that's when the formal notification is made to council that we have received it. They're in our reserves at that point. Okay, if it's possible to get the preliminary understanding to, so we know what's coming. Absolutely, and that's part of those reports that, that you can see on be, a weekly yeah, basis. Yeah, that would be helpful because generally we're only seeing those when we do a fiscal update. Honestly. And it's, oh, well, we've been approved for this, but we're still waiting to go through the process. We, you know, we, we you know, first heard that essentially at the December fiscal update, but I think it would be helpful for our collaborative fiscal planning as we move forward. And then I think, you know, there's some conversations that need to be had about, you know, what we you know should do with those funds? Should it just go back into undesignated reserves, or should it be, you know, focused on you know, emergency response or some type of you know you know recovery efforts, et cetera? So, uh, with that, I'll yield back and appreciate your work. Thank you. All right. Not seeing any other comments. Um, all those in favor of recommending um, this uh, supplemental appropriation to the full council, please raise your hand. And that is unanimous of the two committees. Thank you very much uh, for being here today. Um, <coughs> we will now move on to item two. Actually, all our other items uh, today are, are pretty related. Uh, this, uh, the first one is expedited bill 41-23, fire and rescue services, length of service awards program for volunteers. Um, and I'll turn it over to Ms. Wellens um, to walk us through it. Thank you very much, Madam Vice President. And good morning, council members. Um, so, expedited Bill 4123, Fire and Rescue Services, and we're uh, join, joined by the President of MCV, FRA, Mr. Bernard, um, Chief Cooper, Mr. Lacey, Mr. and Mr. Morales. Um, is Mr. Morales here? Oh, here's Mr. Lacey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Good morning. Um, so we've got a full table here yes. for you. Um, so this expedited bill is the purpose is to implement 
um, one of the several provisions that have been uh, negotiated between the executive and MCV FRA for their new term. And I apologize, on one of the packets, I think it's your next packet, I inadvertently stated the term from FY23 to FY through FY26, but it's actually FY24 through FY26. Um, so the provision that this bill would implement relates to the length, length of service benefits that uh, local fire and rescue department volunteers receive. Um, this is um, similar to um, a pension benefit um, that you get for, for doing all of the years of service as a volunteer. Um, there's some variation based upon, you know, how long you are a volunteer and what type of your a volunteer you were, what types of certifications you had, and you know how how um, I believe you know how many service calls you did, um, and the provision related to these low SAP benefits. You can see it on page two of the staff memorandum. You can see the article twenty five of the MOA that's being implemented here. And essentially, the bill would um, increase the low SAP benefits by 8% for all participants, uh, provide an additional 7.5% increase for certain members who receive low SAP as of December 31st, 2022. Uh, those members would receive a 4% an addition, excuse me, those members would receive a 4% increase in 20, FY25 and another 4% in FY26. Um, you can see the fiscal impact statement it would be about $145,000 for FY24. Um, and to put that in context, um, you know, as you'll actually, as you'll see in the, for the next item, you know, the full, the full budget uh, for the volunteers is around 8.5 million. So it gives you some context of the portion of the budget. Um, I don't think there's anything else I wanted to note for you. Um, and again, we've got a full table of representatives for any questions that you may have. Thanks. Great. Um, before I turn over my colleagues, do you, Mr. Bernard, anyone uh, have any uh, other comments or anything before? Oh, we'd like to thank you for having us here mm -hmm. and for Ms. Wellens putting this awesome package together. We did spend quite an amount of time at the collective bargaining table. Mm -hmm. Very unique. No other volunteer fire rescue department in not only the country but the world has such a provision where we have collective bargaining. Uh, both parties bargained in good faith, uh, spent a lot of time, and this is the end result, the three items you have before you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair Katz. Thank you very much, Madam Vice President. Um, first off, thank you all very, very much for what you do. And I want to publicly thank Ms. Wellens and Ms. Frog because all four of these uh, topics that we have are intertwined, and it's, it, it's, uh, it was a tag team. It's two and two, I guess. Um, but, you know, the hybrid system, I don't have to tell any, any of you sitting at the table, but the hybrid system that we have in Montgomery County, and Eric, you or someone might even know when it actually started, but it caused a lot of excitement when it started. And everybody said, this one's going to work, and that one's going to work, et cetera, et cetera. And you all, the Fire and Rescue Service in Montgomery County, proved, proved every one of those naysayers wrong. And I'm sure that there's days that, that there's a little bit of discussion. I'm not suggesting that there's not, but it works. And to the public, they don't think that it doesn't work at all, even if you're having a couple of, why are you doing this discussions? I think one of the proudest moments that Montgomery County has had, and we've had quite a few over the years, but one of the proudest moments is exactly what you just said, Mr. Bernard, and that this is the only fire service in the world, I mean, in the world, that has a system like this. And we thank the people who do this work uh, many, many families have done this work over the years, There's, and, and we are just so very fortunate that people literally risk their lives on the career side and on the volunteer side, each and, I was going to say each and every day, but it's each and every minute of every day to make sure that every one of our families is safe. So I thank you for doing this, and I'm looking forward to voting for four different topics today. Thank you. <laughs> Council President Friedson. Uh, yeah, ditto. Uh, I, I just want to express my appreciation to the staff, uh, to, to our, our volunteers. We, we're very lucky, 
and I'm very proud, and we all should be very proud uh, to have a hybrid system that works so well. Uh, not always perfect, as nothing is, uh, but uh, boy, does it work when people need it. And uh, having a commitment and a contract with people who are putting their lives at risk, who are taking tremendous sacrifice from their lives and their livelihoods away from their families is beyond appropriate. And it is very important. And it's something that I think we all should be proud of and something that uh, I'm happy to support today. But in general, at a much uh, higher level, really appreciate all of the, the, the efforts that have gone into it. I know there's quite a lot of uh, bargaining uh, uh, and, and, and discussion, really appreciate the, the leadership. Uh, in uh, uh, the department, the executive branch, and also uh, with the association, and uh, just uh, hope that we can continue to think about ways to keep our community safe and to bring people together uh, to, to make that happen. I don't think residents are thinking or care, uh, whether it's a career or a volunteer who shows up uh, to provide them emergency services. They want them to be trained, they want them to be professional, uh, and they want them to help. And that's what happens. Uh, I'm an example of that. Uh, countless others in our community are examples of that. Uh, and it's something that, uh, that I don't take for granted. I know none, none of us uh, on the council take for granted. So really appreciate this and, and look forward to approving it. I'll yield back. Councilmember Mink. Just wanted to express my appreciation um, for our volunteers as well. Um, as President Friedson said, the public doesn't know, doesn't care when somebody shows up in a moment of crisis. They don't care who it is as long as they are there to save the day. And that's what folks can count on when they call on our firefighters. So. You know, when we have these um, bargaining good faith agreements that are reached, it's really important for us to do everything we can to come through and make sure um, that we are substantiating those, that we are funding those to every extent that is possible. So very uh, glad and proud to support you all and to vote for this today. And thank you so much for your service. Councilmember Lukey. Thank you. Well, everybody's already sung everybody's praises, and everybody's already commented on the importance of this, and I think it goes without saying. You all know how much I love and appreciate everything that you do day in and day out, and and, and Council Member makes correct. It's incumbent upon us to make sure we're doing right by people, too. Um, so without further ado, I will wrap this up so we can vote. Thank you. And I just want to add, again, my thanks to all of you. Um, having served as the mayor in the city of Tacoma Park uh, and worked very closely with our volunteers and professionals there, um, you know, being able to see firsthand um, the work together uh, that you all do and the work of the volunteers, I just want to say um, thank you uh, very much. And with that, um, all those in favor of this expedited bill 41-23 to recommend to the full council, please raise your hand. And that is unanimous for the uh, two committees. All right, we're moving along then to item three, which is related to this, a resolution to approve or disapprove provisions of a memorandum of agreement between the county and the Montgomery County Volunteer Fire and Rescue Association. I'll turn it back to Ms. Wellens. Um, thank you, Madam Vice President. And uh, you've already disposed of one of the items related to this agreement um, by your uh, vote to recommend uh, the bill regarding LOSAP. And, this uh, resolution would allow you to approve the other provisions of the, the memorandum of agreement that are subject to council review. And as um, just for, you know this already, but for everybody's benefit, just the context is that the um, items that go for council review um, are those that require an appropriation of funds, have a future fiscal impact or inconsistent with any county law or regulation or require the enactment or adoption of any county law or regulation within that uh, framework you can see on page two of the council member or the staff memorandum shows you the terms of the MOA that are subject to council review the one that you are just considered the length of service awards uh, next up are associating uh, association operating funds the increases in the operating funds would have a fiscal impact of about 24,000 in FY24. It, um, it provides for gradual increases um, to the MCV FRA for association operating funds, 8% effective July 1, 2023, 5% effective July 1, 2024, and 4% effective July 1, 2025. 
Um, and then the other provision subject to your review is the nominal fee. Um, Article 12 of the MOA requires the county to pay. Um, there's, there's an alternative here. It could be either a nominal fee to each um, eligible volunteer of $600 in FY24, 625 in FY25, and 650 in FY26, or if the active volunteer meets certain additional criteria, there's a higher, um, including certifications, um, and receive the maximum allowable low sat points for department or station responses. Um, that individual can earn up to $1,200 in FY24, 1,300 in FY25, and 1,400 in FY26. Again, for the um, nominal fee, and the total fiscal impact for implementing the MOA for FY24 would be about uh, $336,000. Um, and happy to answer any questions, as I'm sure the panel is as well. Thank you. Great. Anyone have any questions? Good. Not seeing. Um, all those uh, in favor of approving this and recommending it to the full council, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Um, all right, we will, we're cruising. Uh, we will now move on to item number four, and I think we're swapping out Miss well Wellens for uh, <laughs> Miss Farag, but I believe everyone else is probably going to not play musical chairs and just stay in their seat. Yeah, playing the part of Ms. Wellens. Yes. Uh, so item number four is a supplemental appropriation 24-23 to the FY24 operating budget, Montgomery County Government, Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Services, general personnel and operating costs. Six hundred and sixteen thousand, uh, six hundred sixteen thousand four hundred dollars And uh, Ms. Farag, I will turn it over to you to walk us through the packet. Good morning, everyone. Susan Farag, Council Staff. Um, as you mentioned, this is for $616,000. I do want to note that even though it indicates it's undesignated fire fund reserves, they're treated as general funds. It's yeah. been put in the general funds, um, which is why both the GO and the Public Safety Committee are um, reviewing this today. And what this will do is it will expand its funding at an already expanded cadet program within MCPS. Last year there was an emergency management um, EMT training that was provided to juniors and seniors and this year they've expanded it to have fire training as well. Fire training is actually much more instructor heavy and intensive so it has more costs. The current cost for the program that was based off of just EMT training is $268,000. MCPS actually pays for half of this. Uh, the proposed supplemental appropriation today is $616,400. That would cover the fire training. Again, it is MCPS, it's fire's understanding that MCPS intends to pay approximately half of that as well. Um, there are currently 14 juniors and four seniors in MCPS who are in the fire program and 21 seniors in the EMT program. Uh, to add fire program to the cadet training program, instructional staff will be more than double. Um, it's very, there are significantly more instructors to support due to the hands-on skills components that are involved. The curriculum for both fire and EMT is unchanged. And the total projected instructor hours for the EMT and fire components together for cadet training program is 5,284 um, hours. So at this point, if you do, dis do recommend approval for the $616,000, it is, was already assumed in the December fiscal update, so it will not have any additional impact on the 16.5% FY24 year-end reserves projected in December. This appropriation will be an ongoing expenditure, however, and have a fiscal impact in future fiscal years. Um, MCPS has expressed strong support for the program, and it's anticipated that they will fund half of the program in the amount of $366,000. The total program costs are itemized on page three for your review. Um, at the time that this staff report was published, there was not a racial equity um, impact assessment available. That came across the street Friday afternoon about 6.30, and I have not had time to add it to this um, staff packet. Um, that REIA does indicate that it does have the potential to improve the diversity of recent recruits, and that was something that was discussed among a joint committee back in October when they looked at different career feeder programs for public safety. Um, the one, there's two pieces that I wanted to bring to your attention. It's my understanding that MCVFRA has applied for and received a federal SAFER grant, and that approximately 100,000 of that was for cadet training. 
Uh, when the council first received the supplemental appropriation back in November, I asked whether those funds could be used for that program. Um, at the time, the department indicated it would need to see the grant application and award to ensure that any expenditure complied with federal requirements. But at that time, it had not yet seen those documents. It would be helpful today if the Joint Committee could understand whether or not those funds could actually be used to partially fund this program, and if so, what's required to make that happen. And the other thing I just wanted to point out that the Joint Committee did talk about last fall was in order to maximize the benefit from this program, the um, council or the executive may wish to explore how to facilitate direct hires of the graduates so they don't have to attend the fire academy again, which duplicates both time and costs, both for the cadets themselves and for instructor time. Um, depending on conversations here today, I'm recommending approval as submitted. Thank you very much, Ms. Rog, for that overview. And I, I will note, just going back to the racial equity statement, we didn't delve into it too much under um, item two, the expedited bill 41-23. But in that racial equity statement related to that bill, it also talks about a cadet program and looking at the cadet program as a promising strategy to diversify um, our fire department. So. Um, I just wanted to connect those dots um, since we don't have uh, the one for this packet uh, available right now. Um, uh, does uh, anyone want to respond uh, regarding the SAFER grant and the future of the cadet program and as it relates to hires before I open it up? Yeah, Mr. Bernard? I uh, would like to say that uh, the association did receive last year a four-year SAFER grant and part of that does include money for the cadet program. Uh, you may recall that we've had we had the pro cadet protocol for, uh, program for many years, and then in 2011-2012, during the Great Recession, that was one of the programs that was defunded by previous leadership. We did apply for a safer grant back in 2015 and received a four-year grant that funded $75,000 per year. And that is simply a pass through through us. We help fund partial overtime payment for the career staff that manages this excellent program. And we partner with MCFRS. Uh, we receive this new grant, additional four years, at $100,000 a year for four years. So a total of $400,000 last year. And we're working with MCFRS to get the necessary paperwork from them. We submit to the federal government. It's all. Uh, based on reimbursement, and then we submit, uh, once we receive it, to uh, MCFRS. So uh, that program is still available, and we work with uh, MCFRS to do the required, it, it's a lot of paperwork for the federal government listening to your first uh, FEMA. It's the same thing, goes through DHS FEMA. Uh, but we are funded for $100,000 a year starting last fiscal year, which we are still in the process of submitting, and then the next three. Councilmember so Mink, and then, yeah. No, sorry. Yeah. Oh, did you want to go? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, just, just wanted to. We talk a lot on, uh, you know, in the education committee as well as I'm sure in, in econ about the importance and the benefits of having workforce development programs that start uh, in high school, in in college, in these in these younger ages, and that funnel our youth into good paying services, jobs, pat, career paths that are that allow them to stay local and do things that they enjoy doing, and that allow them as young people uh, to see a meaningful future for themselves as well well. And so when we have these opportunities to invest in and to build out those programs, especially when those programs happen to be leading kids into county service, the return on the investment there obviously is huge for us. So always glad to see those opportunities uh, when we know that they work, uh, when we know that they have all these uh, benefits as well uh, come before us. So thank you. I'll go to the chair and then council president. Thank you very much. Um, you know, this truly is an investment in our future. This is one smart investment. And it's not just a smart investment for the public, it's a smart investment for that individual. There are times that someone who is academic but might not enjoy every class or what decides that they want to, you know, whether they're going to uh, stay in school. I mean, we, and, and this allows them to do something that they can do, that they want to do. And I think we do need to be exploring how we can be the most efficient and welcoming to that cadet so that they would stay, first off, in service in Montgomery County. I mean, you know, they should get the best deal they can get from here. 
in a, and, and, and we need to make sure that if they're taking a course and have been certified or whatever the right term is, that they don't need to do it a second time. They may need to do a refresher every now and then, but they don't need to do it a second time. I think this is the right thing to do and very glad to support it. Thank you, Thank you. Council President Friedson. Uh, thank you. Thanks to everybody. I think it shows the, the partnership and how well it works that uh, we have the association applying for federal dollars and working in close coordination with the department and figuring out how best to, to utilize it. Uh, that is, you know, the, the proof positive that this is a partnership that really does work well and, and help to improve our emergency response and help to train folks uh, in the way that we want and recruit the representative uh, department and, and, and volunteer network to, you know, have folks who are showing up at times of crisis into people's homes who reflect the people that they're showing up uh, to, to, to help and are part of the communities uh, of, of the people that they're helping, which matters. Um, I just want to understand, make sure I'm understanding the, the financial side of this, though. So we have an authorization here to spend a certain amount of money. Is that for the full additional cost of this program? And then the MCPS piece is half of it, so the anticipation is you're only going to spend half of what you're authorized, and there's also a chance that the $100,000 from the SAFER grant is going to help offset that as well, and that would just leave additional funds that are not tapped into from the fire fund reserves. Am I understanding that correctly? The budget folks here from the executive side can weigh in, but you need to appropriate all of the funding. And it's my understanding the MCPS funding will go to the general fund, and it's my understanding that the SAFER grant would go to the general fund too. So you still have to appropriate the entire $616,000. Dominic Del Pozo, uh, Fiscal Management Division Chief for Fire and Rescue. Uh, yeah, we'd have to appropriate the full amount because we have to spend the full amount. But you're right, there are going to be reimbursements that come in on the revenue side. The two that you mentioned, the uh, MCPS and um, funding from the, uh, the grant. Okay, so could you just formally notify us when we have confirmation that the MCPS half is coming and when the SAFER grant has been confirmed, because I understand there's quite a bit of logistical dynamics, administration, and paperwork that has to happen with yes. a large enterprise like MCPS and an infinitely larger enterprise like the federal government. But, um, you know, obviously that's material information for us, and so we're authorizing all the money, you're telling us that we probably don't need all the money, that it's net less than half of that. So if you could, you know, send over a transmittal that confirms that at the appropriate time, that would be helpful. Uh, with that, happy to support this. Cadet program is very important in public safety. It is a key recruitment tool. We've talked about this a lot on the uh, police department side. We doubled that uh, program. I, I would love to see us continue to do more of that. Uh, throughout public safety because I do think that it's a key way uh, for us to create pathways for our young people and to address the recruitment and retention challenges that we're facing in public safety, which are at near crisis, if not crisis level. So I appreciate all the efforts here and look forward to continuing to, to work on it. Councilmember Lukey. Thank you. And um, I'm super excited that the cadet program is back it, it adding in the full complement of things, which I know, you know, COVID derailed and then you had to get back up and running like many, many things. So I appreciate that. Um, and, and to the points that some of my colleagues have made about, you know, the, the procedural uh, hiccups, if you will, not hiccups, but the cumbersome nature. How about that? That's a better way of phrasing it. The cumbersome nature of making all this work. And, um, and Mr. Bernard, I truly appreciate you going back and talking about the history of the SAFER grant program. But I'm, I'm sort of sitting here wondering why, why because the, the volunteers don't administer the cadet program, um, is it that you're still handling the SAFER grant application process and facilitation because you've always done it? Or, you know, because that's adding an extra layer, if you will, to the current landscape. So could you comment on that for a minute? 
Uh, part of it has to do with the eligibility requirements okay. for SAFER. So the association being a local support function is recognized under federal law having the ability to apply for two areas, recruitment and retention. The county can only apply for hiring of firefighters. Gotcha. So since we fall in that signal category, um, we initially did the application about two years after the cadet program was removed and mm -hmm. county government wasn't able to fund it. And our justification was this is an right. important recruitment tool. Right. And uh, so once we got that grant, MCPS got on board and the county government found funds. So it, it is part historical, but it's more that yeah. the county is not eligible to apply for in that area. And that, but yet it's still eligible to be a subgrantee, if you will, for the funds to pass through from you to that program, and that yes. keeps it all copacetic. In, in the okay. write-up, we explain that yep. we're not running it. We partner with MCFRS yep. and okay. we're trained to the same standards, and that the right. goal is to get them to volunteer within a volunteer fire department in the county and mm -hmm. hopefully go on to a career path. Right. And let me just note that the county keeps the statistics on our diversity. Mm -hmm. And we have seen uh, since the law change creating mm -hmm. the single fire department under one fire chief right. and phenomenal leaders, we've gone to almost 50% female and over 50% minority in the people we've recruited since 2004. Excellent. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Councilmember Mink. Thank you. Um, following up on that on that exact point, which were which is great to see that the the t cadet class is over over half non-white, almost half female, which is great. Um, and we want to know if the recruiting class and the retained officers are going to continue to reflect those demographics. So as we continue to have this conversation, um, that level of detail in the demographics will be great for continuing uh, to bolster support for the program, obviously. Uh, and then we funded uh, an FTE. Um, for DEI functions, if I recall, in the last budget. Uh, is that something that you think is going to help you all to maintain these, uh, the stats that we're seeing and to help turn that over into uh, further recruitment and retention? I'll turn that over to the fire chief. The numbers I gave were for the volunteers in the LFRDs. Right, right, That's right. not specific for the uh, cadet program. Mm -hmm. So Gary Cooper acting in the capacity of the interim fire chief. Uh, the answer to your question is that is the goal. Uh, the DEI officer has not yet been hired. We are in the process at this time. Great, thank you. Well, that's certainly something that will, as that moves forward, that we'll want to talk about and hear about. Hopefully, all the success is there. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, um, all those in favor of recommending the supplemental appropriation to full council, please raise your hand. And that is unanimous of both uh, committees. Our final item today is Supplemental Appropriation 24-3 to the FY24 Operating Budget, Montgomery County Government, Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Service, FY24, Montgomery County Volunteer Fire and Rescue Association contract. Um, this is related to um, the items we already discussed, items two and three, but Ms. Farag, do you want to walk us through our final item today? Thank you very much. This supplemental appropriation funds in part the LOSAP bill and the MCBFRA agreement that you just voted to recommend approval of, so there's no pressure here as far as funding these elements. But. <laughs> Um, so county law requires uh, the executive to submit to the council any element of this agreement that requires an appropriation of funds or may have a future impact. So the total here today is 336188 This is paying for the nominal fee, the low SAP, and MCV FRA operating funds. And there's an itemized breakout for you on page three to show those costs. Um, the racial equity impact statement that we received um, indicates that based on the limited information accompanying this supplemental request, the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice's ability to confidently assess any racial equity impacts, be they of benefit or burden to county residents and MCVFRS workforce was restricted. So they did not have a recommendation there. Um, in terms of the training piece of this, this generally, this supple these funds usually come over as part of the operating budget and there's historically been a training component that costs money. There was no funding added for training in this recommended supplemental appropriation. That is because the agreement stated on page four recommends MCVFRS, 
requires the fire department to work with the volunteers to determine whether or not there is a need for additional classes, right? So we don't know if those additional classes are guaranteed or not. One is for the emergency vehicle operations courses, which again is very instructor heavy and requires a lot of time. And the other is for basic life saving. Um, the department has indicated to me that each additional EVOC course for the emergency vehicle training would require about 260 instructor hours um, or about 19,500 per class. The agreement also requires at least one BLS um, continuing, continuing education class per quarter. The department has indicated that they have many training opportunities available for BLS and the associated instructor overtime for that offering would be very minimal. So it would be helpful today if the Joint Committee could understand better whether or not the department and the volunteers assume that there is an identified need for an additional course. Um, if there is, I'm recommending that additional funding be added to this because, and I know I sound like a broken record and public safety committee is probably tired of me on this, but the fire department has an ongoing, ongoing multi-year operational deficit due primarily to overtime that it has not been appropriately budgeted. And right now they're looking at seeing about $11 million cost overrun for overtime. While I know that 19,500 is an infinitesimal piece of that whole thing, for policy purposes, I am recommending adding it. I do not want to add to the deficit. So council staff is recommending approval of the supplemental appropriation with additional funding. If it's determined today, they need an additional EVOP course before June 31st. Um, I see we were joined. Uh, and whether or not, uh, are you the appropriate person to discuss the EVOP course and whether, all right, I, I will turn it over to you then, yes. Hi, I'm Assistant Chief Beth Sanford from the Training Academy. I think we've met before from across the same table. Uh, so the EVOC class, uh, the volunteers, uh, it, it's, a, it's an area of training that the volunteer uh, companies have felt that they need more EVOC classes. Um, there was some uncertainty in, it, in whether that was actually the case or not. So what, what was agreed upon in the contract that Susan was referring to uh, is that contractually we have agreed to offer six classes. Whether we actually run the class will be dependent on the enrollment in the class. So if there's sufficient enrollment, we'll run the class, obviously. So that number six is an increase of uh, roughly two additional classes. Some years we offer five, some years we offer four, or rather we teach four and teach five. They're asking us to be prepared to teach six which we are prepared to teach them. We will offer them. Um, it, you know, there's, there's a bit of a question mark with respect to whether we actually run the class. So let me just, I want to make sure I understand. The, what, we're, what we have received um, as the request here covers the six classes. Correct, in the form of an additional two classes, or right. one. Is, is it two? I think it's two. So my understanding, there's no additional money, and to actually run these additional two classes would cost additional overtime. So the agreement has those additional two classes, but the but supplemental don't the appropriation money. itself does not reflect what I believe is the appropriate funding to provide those classes. No. Chair Katzia. Yeah. Thank you. Is the 19,000 whatever figure, does that is that for both classes or is that for per class? It's per class. So the additional would be the 38,000, whatever the, the, the change is on that. Is that what you're right. saying? Right. I think it would be helpful. If Chief Stanford, when are these classes actually scheduled now or are you going to schedule them? So three of them are scheduled now for the spring semester. Three more will be scheduled in the fall. And are you, oh, sorry, are, are the classes, do you, do you know what the enrollment is for the three that have been scheduled already? One of them is full, the other two are not close to full. Okay. And how, sorry, how long have you been at sort of advertising? Have they been open um, for folks to enroll in? So we open the registration generally at the end in December, January. The EVOC classes generally don't run until spring. Um, so on one hand, it's not alarming or super mm -hmm. surprising that the other two classes are not full. They, they, they don't run till later in the, in the late spring. So, you know, it's not a, 
an unusual statement to say they're not full yet. So we close the class a month before we run, before the start date of the class. So there's still quite a bit of time, time between before the other ones close. Great. And, and thank you. And I did want to note that uh, Pete Perringer is here and he's already taken a picture of us. So. Uh, I, know, I know that everybody's shocked about that. Um, and I'm certainly supportive of the additional classes and, and whatever monies it takes to, to do them. But we did hear some concern from the volunteers the other night about the timing of the classes. That at times, and I and you're going to have to figure. I mean, first off, you know, if you ask your family to sit down to dinner, there's somebody that can always says, "But I'd like it, you know, at a different time." But um, I, I think there needs to be a discussion that there's not overlap, or that somebody who's volunteering or whatever could could uh, take uh, two classes. And a weekend rather than that there's the two classes are at the same time in that weekend so I, that's what we heard don't know how how that could be done uh, but I think that's something that obviously we should be trying our best to figure out how how that could be accommodated yep understood I you know they I'm always always happy and open to talk about whatever schedule um, issues and concerns you know folks want to bring up just for your understanding it really kind of depends on what classes they are right, right? Um, if somebody wants to take fire one and EMT we would strongly recommend against that those are they're pretty challenging classes um, and that's a pretty heavy load uh, for for a person to take undertake simultaneously uh, but there are other classes that it's completely reasonable and it really is is dependent on what the class is. Thank you. And, and might we add, you do, I know you're getting ready to retire, but you have done uh, a terrific job for Montgomery County and we're most appreciative. Thank, thank you, you very you. much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank Council you. President Friedson. Well, thank you. I was going to start with uh, that, Chief Sanford. Thank you for all of your service. How many, uh, how many classes have you <laughs> led? I've been at the training academy for, by the time I leave, it'll be exactly four years at the academy and just a little under 30 years in total service. Um, so I'm spending my last four years at the academy, which have been great, as you heard me say at graduation the other day. Well, we're very grateful, and I know there are many cadets and, uh, and, and uh, folks who have benefited from your service that uh, very much appreciate all well, of your, I do appreciate your, your it. expertise. I Thank you. I think it's also helpful to understand too that um, you know the we've had issues with low enrollment. We're aware that you know Mr. Katz probably that's some of what the concern has been. Um, it's a it's a steep hill to climb uh, because you know trying to strike the right balance between offering a class that has low enrollment and you know typically of course at a college they just cancel the class um, or trying not to do that to the extent possible and one of the pretty big things that we've done actually it's not pretty big it's huge uh, is to offer the classes uh, MIFRI is the state organization that oversees um, fire rescue training uh, and we are our, our academy is accredited uh, in part under under MIFRI uh, and we've opened all of our classes uh, all of the MIFRI classes that we run uh, normally in the past we've only offered them to MCFRS in an effort to try to um, alleviate the low enrollment cancellations we've opened them to the state so if you're from say you know Howard County or Prince George's County you can come to Montgomery County and take that class uh, the other jurisdictions in the state do that we have done that um, with uh, I just opened that up in the last year it hasn't taken hold quite the way that I thought it would uh, but nonetheless um, you know that's it's pretty big in terms of sort of in the inner workings of fire departments in the state uh, and you know just you know uh, uh, trying to es essentially say look we're not we don't want to have to cancel the class we want to be able to run it if we can let's see if we can get the enrollment from somewhere else so that fiscally it makes sense to go ahead and run the class so I just want to make sure I understand there's six classes we're adding two classes there's three in the spring and three in the fall that spans two fiscal years 
do we need to add an, one additional? Like, would there have been two in the spring and two in the fall, and we're adding a third to each? Yes. So really, we would have to add one in the spring, and then the rest would be covered in the next fiscal year's budget, I would presume, right? We were at, we were offering four. Now we're going to offer six. Is is that right, the question so that would you're be asking? Meaning spring and fall. Correct. Right. Three, so, three each. Yeah, so that would be one additional in this current fiscal year, this spring, a third in this spring. Yes. So I would say, what is it, 19,100? Can I just add to that? How yeah. many EVOP courses did you run this fall? Because this supplemental appropriations for the fiscal year and would have included anything that you provided in the fall. We ran two classes last fall, this past fall. Okay, so. Yeah, I just we're offering I'm a, three. This it's the additional year. expense that we have for what's before us right now, right? Right. So it's only yes. So if there's only if there's one, one additional, additional class, class, whether it's full or not, if you're offering it, we should we should budget for it. Period. Okay. To me, I mean that's like a non-starter. Like, so let's budget for it. I would move. Is do I have the right amount? Nineteen thousand one hundred. Is that the nineteen thousand five hundred? Excuse me. That's for one class. And that more confirming that's the third additional class that was not budgeted? Correct. Okay. I would move adding 19500 to this supplemental appropriation to cover that additional class. No. Council Member, Chair Katz seconded. All those in favor of additional? It's unanimous. Um, any other comments on this? Council Member Mink. Thanks. Yeah. Um, it, I'm just thinking about it. so the you obviously you hate to see classes move forward that are under enrolled, but just wanted to better understand what that means. Do are our enrollment standards for these classes um, the same enrollment standards that are being used in other jurisdictions in terms of where the cutoff is, and is our cutoff standard um, based on like a cost benefit analysis uh, in terms of like a budgetary calculation, or is it a safety calculation? Uh, just wanting to better understand. It's definitely class dependent. Uh, for example, all, all those factors you talked about. For example, uh, we, one of the classes, one of the uh, just above entry level classes we offer is a rescue tech site ops, site operations. That class uh, has a pretty significant safety factor that we have to be mindful of. So it's very instructor heavy because folks are using heavy tools and extrication equipment and so forth. Those of you that came to fire ops, you got a chance to wield some of those things around. Uh, so there's a safety factor involved there, and then there's also uh, the class minimum is a little bit different because we need a certain amount of people mm -hmm. to be able to safely, con you know, engage in evolution. Right. I need you know people on the hose line, people on the tools, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that our, would be our, sorry. Are our county standards there the same as other? Is that like a statewide MIFRI number that's set? Uh, so the minimum it, in this particular case is the is the MIFRI minimum, which is 75%. MIFRI is pretty much a flat 75% of the maximum enrollment. Different classes have different maximums, uh, but MIFRI the the MIFRI rule is 75%. Now, depending on the class, I'll run a class with less less than 75%. Say for example, it's fire officer one or EMS company level ops. That's a very instructor light class, right? So it's not a burdensome, and I can find the instructors, and it's you know it fiscally the same for one person as it is for twenty people. Uh, so again, it's it's different classes require have different um, uh, standards surrounding them. Is there a state standard? Yes, it's the Mifri standard that I provided you. Uh, in Montgomery County, we, we, we do adjust those. EVOC is one that we've made significant adjustments to in, in a couple of different uh, arenas. One of them is safety-wise. Uh, MIFRI has lowered the uh, hours of that class over the last several years. They, they had been at 36. They dropped down to 24. Now they're at 21 hours, and they don't include a um, driving component. Well, we find that mm -hmm. not acceptable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know we have a significant driving component for us that's a 50 hour class five zero so it's much more uh, aggressive in terms of hours and requirements and so forth and we want the folks that are taking that class to feel they tend to be mostly younger people um, and you know to be a little informal about it 
Uh, they're used to driving their Toyota Corollas and not an ambulance, <laughs> right? And we want them to feel comfortable behind the wheel of an ambulance, and we give them a lot of driving time. They're, they, they do classroom work. They do what we call cone work, which is on-site at the training academy where we have a course set up, and they're not allowed out of the cone co uh, They're not allowed onto the street until they're successful on the cone course. Additionally, it's a pretty small class because we don't want a whole lot of people who've never driven a big vehicle driving around. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Same as, you know, for one of our truck company classes, right? Uh, aerial class A, uh, tractor drawn aerial class. We don't want a lot of people driving a, a, a tractor drawn aerial uh, all at the same time. Um, it's just not safe, right? For obvious reasons. So the EVOC class, we cap that at 15, 16. Um, you know, so that's a smaller class because we, you know, don't want that many brand new drivers in larger pieces of, of uh, apparatus, ambulances, you know, driving around. Um, so that's, and the hours of the class are vastly different than what MIFRI requires. So um, we feel that that's a, an a, appropriately built in safety factor. And, you know, so those are some of the areas where we sometimes differ from the state. Understood. Thank you. Um, and then my other question is um, whether do members of the volunteers uh, instruct for any of the courses? Um, and if not, is that something that is that an angle that could be considered? Uh, and would that potentially help with being able to fill some of those instructor roles and maybe gain some flexibility with scheduling? Yep, we've been really clear since I've gotten there. We welcome any volunteer who wants to go through the instructor checkoff process. Uh, we have a few EMT volunteer instructors um, who are excellent, uh, super top notch, and generally will take one full EMT class each semester. Uh, we don't have volunteer participation as far as instructors go. Uh, with respect to the other classes. Uh, we do have uh, a few instructors right now, or a few volunteers that are participating in our Acquired Structure Training Program, which is an off-site training program. Uh, we're doing an abbreviated instructor intake process for Acquired Structure Training, and we've had a, um, a, a minimal amount of interest, but some nonetheless. There are state requirements for instructors and there are quite a lot of hoops to jump through it's a pretty big commitment um, so for the volunteer members to be what we call MICRB certified um, that those are there are a lot of hoops to jump through for that um, but AST we can we can kind of uh, gradually bring you in uh, at a with a much lower commitment level but still you know get some volunteer help with respect to acquired structure training Great, thanks. So, so to be make sure that I'm understanding this right, um, any volunteer, same as career, who would be able to say go to another jurisdiction and and teach a particular course, they would also be able to teach to be an instructor here in Montgomery County uh, under the same. If they were MICRB level two instructors, yes, they would have to have that certification. And so, and that's. I don't know the acronyms, but okay. all the technicalities. Yeah. Thank you for bearing with me. But that's the same standard that's used across. The MICRB level yeah. two is a state is a state level certification. So if we're teaching the MIFRI class, and that mm -hmm. person has MICRB level two, yes, they can teach that class. Got it. Got it. Thanks. So, um, so you're saying that we do have instructors from the volunteers for some of our classes, for some of those others with with greater requirements. We do not see the volunteers because there's a significant amount of time, I would imagine, that has to be put into that. Um, and I just, I wonder if there's, uh, if there might be some discussions that could be had maybe on the, on the volunteer side, if we could to help encourage folks who might want to, uh, who might have interest in that. Do you have thoughts on, on effort, recruitment efforts for instructors maybe that might be beneficial? I don't know if there might be like a, a deal that can work out that, that could be worked out that could be economically beneficial as well. Um, I just wonder if this is a side of things that could be uh, beefed up a little bit for the county's overall benefit um, and for the force's overall benefit. Certainly not discounting um, uh, Chief Sanford, you've done an incredible job being really creative about all of the different ways to beef up our programming, to beef up our instructions, to increase the collaboration. You've just, you've been phenomenal. Um, and just trying to think of, is there anything else additionally that we could do? Um, yeah, do, do you all on the uh, uh, on the volunteer side have any thoughts about that that you want to share? Please feel free or, or Chief Sanford. Okay. We, we would always be willing to 
uh, add volunteers to any component in, in the service. We do have some excellent instructors that teach outside of Montgomery County, and as Chief Sanford said, we do deviate usually always on adding training, so it's a tremendous benefit to our volunteers to get the best training in the country, and people come from all over. So yes, we, we continue to work with uh, Chief Sanford and uh, MCFRS to add volunteers, and we have some that are interested, but it is a very large hurdle to overcome. One of the things that we've tried to do is to, um, and we've had some success, is uh, is adopt a, a sort of an, a, an adjunct pool of instructors that don't have the MICRB level two, that state required certification. Every class requires that, that we have a certain proportion of, of the instructors that meet that criteria. But we don't always have to have every instructor. So, for example, if I can, if I mm. can, you know, get somebody a few of the skills, and we use them as adjunct instructors in some of the of the skill stations, for example, um, then then that's something that we've explored, and we've had some some pretty good success with it with the career folks. And again, starting to have some success with acquired structure training. That's the principle of how we're using them in acquired structure training, and hopefully, then we can we can grow that into adjunct. Uh, you know, primary class adjunct instructor and, you know, kind of get folks built up in that way. And and also if they don't want to be lead instructors, I can still use them as adjuncts because there are lots of classes that are very skill heavy and, and require a lot of, as Ms. Frog said, a lot of instructor support. So yes, That's we great. can use use volunteers in that manner. Awesome, that's great. Thanks so much. Um, obviously the last thing anybody wants to see uh, is to have a, a funded class that then has to get canceled due to uh, under enrollment or not having enough instructors or whatever the case may be for a certain <laughs> moment. And so uh, very much appreciate your all's uh, collaboration and creative thinking on that. Councilmember Lukey, uh, quickly. Um, so uh, I have a question because need and enrollment are obviously two different things and, and, and my sense is need overall is high for more, more people, more training, more, more everything, but enrollment is only, you know, we have to have a certain number of bodies in the chairs and, and of course we only have a certain number of bodies we're working with and we want more of them. Um, have you explored regional partnerships? I know you mentioned having other departments, but like doing, you know, surrounding counties participating in and any kind of um, sharing agreements you can have with them to help also support the complement of instructors as well as help make sure we have full classes. So the, the MIFRI uh, circumstance that I explained a few minutes ago mm -hmm. is like, again, it's, it's a pretty high level significant expansion into partnering with other parts of the state. Uh, it's, a, it's Maryland only um, right. and for a variety of reasons that is um, technically the audience we should really kind of stay with. Um, DC and Virginia, you know, in, in practice the requirements aren't all that different but on paper they're different. Oh, sorry, I meant Frederick, Carol, Howard, yep, PG. Yep, yep. I, I meant only in Maryland, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. So just to clarify, uh, and yes, so the MIFRI just opens up the entire state. Every jurisdiction, every municipality, everybody that has a department mm -hmm. um, is is able to, to take a class through MIFRI. Um, and there, there's right. no, that's an established process. Um, truthfully, um, you know, Montgomery, because we're very busy and big. We're the the, the biggest training right. academy in the in the state. Right. In in the past, generally we've filled every single class we're offering and then some. Um, again, kind of because of you know EMT, for example. I know the volunteers would greatly appreciate if we taught more EMT classes. Mm -hmm. uh, our standard in Montgomery County is higher than the state standard, uh, and you know we feel that the that it's appropriate. We have added content that we want our EMTs to, to have and we want them to feel proficient and you know able to go out and take care of a patient, right? Um, so our, our threshold, our, our, our standard is higher. Uh, it's 212 hours. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a long course. It's very, uh, it's very involved and it's a, it's a pretty high student commitment, right? The students really have to have to be be in it to win it, as they say. 
Um, the MIFRI standard is is lower, and I I want to say I don't remember exactly how many hours. I'm sorry. I think it's That's roughly 150, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Please don't quote me there. But it's less. Uh, so what that means for us in consequence is uh, that it's hard for us to offer more than two classes per semester, four classes per year, um, at that 212 mm -hmm. hour uh, threshold. Um, so um, it, it's it just not, we're just not logistically able to do more than that. Um, we also have space considerations that we've had a brief yeah. chat about yeah. in the past. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but we're definitely, you know, as far as opening up to MIFRI, we also have a lot of, a lot of informal exchange with other jurisdictions. Sure. For sure. example, Frederick, you brought up. We have a flashover simulator, which yep. I think some of you have been in. Yep. Um, Frederick and some of our other neighbors don't have a flashover simulator, right. and but they what they have that we don't is they're allowed to do a Class A burn. So we have lots of um, handshake agreements of you know they come and use the flashover simulator and we go to them for Class A burning. Gotcha. So we've we've got that that's ongoing and super productive. So um, and given the the difference in the standards that you mentioned. Um, do we offer a comparative compliance so that those who have met the MIFRI standards in other jurisdictions, either either as a volunteer or as a paid, um, you know, a member of a fire service, are able to come to Montgomery County and take only the comparative compliance portion? So another great question: uh, If they've taken the MIFRI course, we'll accept MIFRI uh, in EMT. If they have a national registry EMT, we'll accept that. Mm -hmm. um, we still require them to engage um, either EMT or paramedic to engage in a in a county supplemental like what you're okay. talking about. Um, that's for paramedics. It's very formal. For EMT, it's a little less formal and station based, uh, where we do an evaluation to make sure that that each of the the LFRDs or the mm -hmm. stations mm -hmm. um, like feel okay about you going to take care of their grandmother. Right. Uh, for EVOC, for example, that's one of the ones where we used to have an equivalency. We, uh, and I, I made the decision totally accept responsibility. So we stopped that equivalency process when MIFRI lowered their number of required hours. Right. It just, we felt that it wasn't safe. Now we have agreed um, uh, formally in the, con in the directly negotiated agreement with the MCVFRA to evaluate whether that is still a, a good stance to have and is there a way we can develop an equivalency, a, a different equivalency mm -hmm. that, that allows that transition to take place. So that's something that we have yet to, to, to do, um, but we'll do that and see where that gets us. Um, it's sort of, I, I don't know where it'll get us, right? It'll take a pretty significant upgrade right. equivalency to, to get that person to where Montgomery County feels that they need to be with respect to ambulance driving. Right. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for spending uh, the last few minutes uh, delving into the training that we're doing. Uh, I'm going to ask now. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Mr. Bernard. Did you want to ask something? We work very closely with Chief Sanford, the Academy, and as you see in our collectively bargained agreement, there were issues. Two were shown today where Montgomery County has added significant hours to courses that uh, no one else in the state has. And we support additional training. Uh, so what this has compelled us to do in the last three years, the Burtonsville Volunteer Fire Department, Bethesda Fire Department, and Bethesda Chevy Chase Rescue Squad have each held multiple EMT classes through MIFRI at their facilities. We have one running right now. So. Um, that challenge of making up that 60 to 70 hours difference um, is significant for the academy to provide space and instructors and then for the volunteers to have to do that on our own. We're getting the same state certification and we've not been presented with any empirical data to show that an EMT trained, if I took it at College Park at Mifri, um, operates any differently or uh, doesn't pass any standardized tests than taking it in Montgomery County. And these issues we have struggled with in collective bargaining. We are in a reopener right now dealing again with these issues because we haven't come to agreement where's that happy medium. Uh, Chief Sanford talked about with uh, the equivalency. That has dropped down the number of drivers we are training 
uh, through MIFRI in collaboration with the Academy down to almost zero. So uh, we're asking for more classes and we're asking for hours that our volunteers can make. And it is a challenge for Montgomery County government who are employing all these instructors that are perhaps working during the day and then we're asking them to come at night and weekends to teach. So it's not just one way. We, we recognize that, but we have not solved that problem. And we are seeing that in our retention tools and our training tools where if we're canceling a class, we've got to figure out why. And yes, you talked about what's that happy medium. Not all these classes have state required hours. These are classes that are created here in Montgomery County. And we want to debate and negotiate what those hours are. We think right now they're too high and the numbers are too high that we're just not able to meet and we're not getting the classes and it's a problem. So I'm confident that outside of you guys, we have collectively bargained and will continue to work with the uh, MCFRS to come up with the right numbers. Thank you, Mr. Menard, and thank you um, for all the parties working on this um, through the collective bargaining process. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, Chief Stanford, thank you for all your excellent work, um, and uh, I'm sure this is something that the Public Safety Committee will continue uh, to look at. Um, and I would just like to um, see if I, I believe we have the Supplemental Appropriation 24-3 as amended on the table uh, for approval to recommend to the full council. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And that is unanimous um, by the both committees. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everyone who's taken uh, their morning to spend with us today as we work through uh, each of these items. And we all know that a great deal of work went in uh, to not just preparing the packets, but to the conversations that led to these agreements. And we appreciate all of the work everyone has done. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you all soon. And we are adjourned. <laughs>